Now, Patrick, do we want to jump into and talk about the BC Homes for People? This is a recent report that was put out. Very, very fascinating in terms of what was put out. And, and I'm kind of curious, Patrick, your thoughts on this. This comes on the heels of uh, Ontario pushing through the legislation they did. Is this a bit of a reaction by BC in order trying to get ahead of what or trying to follow up on what Ontario did? What are your, what's your thought on kind of the positioning of this BC Homes for People? And then we can dig into the report because there's a lot going on there. Some good, some mm, not so good. Well, the report cracks me up. Homes for People. Good to know that it was for people and not for something else. I don't know what it would be. Homes for Pets. I don't, I can't imagine what it would be. But the point is this, is that, you know, the report itself is, I think it was 32 pages. I reviewed the report and it's really light on any kind of, uh, I guess, content that is meaningful. It's a real strong overview, uh, lots of fluff, lots of rhetoric. Uh, so the report itself is not that great. Now, a couple of articles have come out where Dave Ebby, Premier Dave Ebby was interviewed. And I have to be honest with you, it, as always, is light on any kind of execution plans. So it talks at a high level, we're gonna build more, more uh, real estate, more affordable homes, all of the stuff that they want to talk to. That's the politics side of it, but I don't see them executing. And there's one particular uh, piece, JG, I sent you the note on one of Dave Edby quotes that just fired me up, which was, this is an indication of where our politicians are. And uh, why don't you just take a minute and read that quote, and then you'll kind of relate to it better. Or we will. Well, the quote, the quote, there's actually a lot of things in this report I want to I want to read. Yeah. But in order to not keep people waiting, I think the quote that you're talking about here is uh, the component about this where it says, we still, this is quote from the report, we still need to invest massively as well in public rental housing. So landlords are no longer able to charge such ridiculous rents on their second and third income properties. And we need to focus on building pleasant missing middle density so people don't think they're forced to choose between a spacious but unaffordable single family home or a concrete box in the sky. Here's the fundamental problem that you hear that quote from Dave Ebby, and it's the problem that we see right across government. You know, they're implying that it's the landlords overcharging for rent which, you know, I guess there's always a scenario where people will take advantage or there are those landlords who are taking advantage of a very low vacancy rate, no doubt about it, there always is. That is not the norm, that's the exception, but he implies it's the norm. You know, he doesn't address the fact that, number one, interest rates have gone up, insurance costs have gone up, and oh, by the way, you know, talk about Vancouver, BC overall, and the property tax increases that have come up, and all of a sudden he's saying we're overcharging as landlords. It just fires me up, Not, and primarily it fires me up because it just shows how much, number one, politics over policy is going on, and or how out of touch our government is with what the reality of being a rental housing provider is. And by the way, they've got a rental housing shortage. So don't be trash talking landlords or making them wrong because they're actually what is providing the housing. So when a politician makes that kind of a statement, it just drives me kind of crazy because it really isn't true, number one, and there's no substance behind this statement. Because if they're going to uh, if they're going to provide this kind of uh, idealistic uh, environment for rentals, it means that there's going to be some rental affordability, and ultimately, what are they going to do? Subsidize it, which then the taxpayers going to carry. So it's all just out of touch with the reality of I, I think reality of business overall is what I find in general with politics. But anyways, I, that particular statement is really indicating to me that we are not going to look forward to any great success in terms of the program that he's offering. Well, let, let's, I, I agree with you, Patrick. I mean, that the way that he set that up is just, you know, baloney in my opinion. I got stronger words than that, but I'll reserve them for <laughs> off camera. But here's what I will say to someone listening to this show. If you're a rental housing provider, number one, you shouldn't let this kind of stuff worry you. And here's why. The reason, Patrick, is because we know politicians make this kind of stupid promises and they say these kinds of things to appeal to the masses, which the masses don't own real estate in their landlord kind of rental housing provider way. And they're trying to appeal to their voter base. They're trying to get votes. That's why they say things like this, even though, quite frankly, we both know it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Because let's just break it down, Patrick. If you ask any landlord, any rental housing provider in BC, hey, how's your cash flow on that property? Most of them are cash flow negative. They're losing money 
every single month in order to provide people with housing. And this guy has the audacity. I was going to use a bad word. This guy has the audacity to say stupid stuff like this. When in fact, you got these landlords that are actually losing money month in and month out to provide housing. So that's the real reality of what's happening out there in BC and in parts of Ontario. So, you know, I just want those that are in the game like you and I are, Patrick, not to listen to this stuff. It could be very disheartening for some people to, to read stuff like this. It's not the reality. This guy's just trying to get reelected and hopefully he doesn't. Yeah. And I think we can go on to the next part of this because I think there's some substance in here that, you know, we can talk about what they are doing that I think is some some positive moves that they're going to make if they pull it off. I'll go into a couple of things to give some context, Patrick, and then you can give your thoughts on it, which is they're following suit, in my view, what Ontario did, except they're going a little further. And, and that is in Ontario, we passed legislation that any uh, property you can add up to three units now. You can have a single family, a duplex, or even a triplex, including coach homes. You can do that in Ontario. They're doing the same, but they're actually going up to four units. That's what they're proposing, is you can go up to any four units on a traditional single family detached. That's fantastic, Patrick. That provides an incredible amount of density and really good options for us as real estate um, real estate investors. And I hope that that part of it goes through. Now, there's a lot of parts of this report where they say things like they're going to make it easier uh, for secondary suites. Uh, you know, how they plan to do that is always the devil's in the details, as you know, Patrick. But there's some, there's many parts of this report which are actually quite good. It all depends on how it's going to be executed. And I don't know if you, if the report specified that, Patrick, is it going to be legislation? Is it going to be passed legislation like it was in Ontario? Or is it going to be different? Well, they, yes, it's got to be passed. So this is suggested at this point. This is on the table. It has not been passed and they do have to pass it. And, you know, in order to take that residential, that single family and turn it into a multi they actually have to, of course, make sure setbacks are all right and the footprint, uh, uh, the envelope is right. So there's still lots of conditions that go with it um, yet to be determined. But they're talking about having that all in place by, I believe, uh, late summer and uh, starting to move forward in building some stuff. There's also another part of this, Patrick, I want to read because these are the parts that and this may not make any sense whatsoever for a lot of people. Some people may want to take advantage of this, but... Uh, the, the report says beginning in early 2024, homeowners will be able to ac access a forgivable loan of 50% of the cost of renovation up to a maximum of $40,000 over five years. Over time, the loan can be forgiven if the homeowner meets all conditions laid out in the program, including renting the unit at below market rates for a minimum of five years. Now, before you freak out, Patrick, and I know what you're thinking, because I, I think the same, but the devil's in the details. Sometimes they say below market rates and their market rate is way above the actual rental rate. And, and just by being a little below that, you can qualify for this kind of program. So it's kind of funny how they put these words on paper. And often it means very little until we get all the way down and see what the brass tax is. You see what the actual details are. Uh, but what are, you, what are your thoughts on that, Patrick? Well, I mean, as you say, you know, we know that, you know, why would anybody in business other than government, you know, do that? Why would they give up five years? What And, and who's setting the rate, to your point? And, uh, you know, they did a similar program. I don't want to say similar. They did a program in Edmonton a few years ago. It was $20,000 totally forgivable, but you had to rent to what they call low income or lower income, which I think they set the bar at 50 grand. I don't remember the exact number. The point was this. Number one, you couldn't find anybody that was making less money than that. So you had trouble renting it out and they had to have income verification in order for you to get that 20 grand back that you put into it. And so there was troubles with that. And then ultimately you were attracting a tenant profile that didn't fit, for example, in the neighborhood that you actually bought your single family and put a basement suite in it. And therefore you were attracting a tenant profile that just wasn't good. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't a healthy tenant profile. If you, I'll use that term because, and they were too low of income. So they were struggling all the time. They were on some kind of, uh, you know, government support, whether it be welfare or whatever. But the point is this, is that these programs are brought from government bureaucrats that don't actually listen and have conversations with the people that are in the trenches. That's always the problem with them. So, you know, what have I got to say about that? I think it's, uh, you know, the devil's in the details. As you say, we'll see what they have to uh, offer, but I'm not optimistic.
I can tell you that what's happened in Ontario, speaking from experience, is, uh, you know, and, and listen, the, the legislation Doug Ford passed was not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but it moved uh, Ontario forward meaningfully in terms of allowing us investors. And it gave us some other tools in our toolbox with regards to the coach homes, with regards to the ARUs, with regards to these different bylaws that are being passed now. Definitely, it's been a positive move forward. Is it perfect? No. Has it helped us? Definitely. And I hope the same happens to BC. Yeah, well, I agree. I hope it does. But again, all these housing programs that they're offering are going to be, you know, they're going to be lag time. It's going to take some time for it to all happen. So for some, it's going to be beneficial. I think that uh, it isn't going to solve any problems anytime soon. And already some of the government's starting to back off on some of the numbers that they were saying that they're going to achieve like 150,000 new homes in 10 years. And they're realizing that there's no chance that that's going to happen. So these are all things that as investors, we have to pay attention to, because if we want to get into it, like if we're going to play the game, we have to know what game we're playing and understand that some people will say, well, if they're going to be building all this. There's going to be too much supply. Are we at risk of that? And that may have some investors actually kind of back off a little bit and, I, you know, my experiences and what we're seeing so far is the government is part of what caused or most of what caused the problem. So there's certainly not going to be those who solve the problem. If anybody's listening to this show and truly listening, they should not be afraid of too much housing. They should not be afraid of an oversupply because even the promises, Patrick, of 150,000 new units built for the next 10 years, which is 1.5 million units. We've shown with data, with numbers, that we're doing that right now. That's that's There's no new supply there. Like that's already our average. Uh, that doesn't fix the problem. In fact, as immigration continues to go up, it only gets tougher and tougher and tougher. And you can see that with this year's uh, supply numbers in terms of our spring market. We're at an all time low in terms of listings on the market all time low, 20 year low. When I say all time, 20 year low is what I mean. Um, that's just an indication of where this is heading, which is it's not getting better yet. No, it's not getting better yet. So uh, this is where we go back, JG, in terms of what's happening in the market. We're seeing the market start to pick up, although listings are still very low. Uh, people are actually outspending. They're actually getting mortgages. They're buying homes. Uh, mortgage rates have kind of stabilized given the uh, bond yields and all I've got to say is that these we, we've been talking about this for months through this whole thing. We said there's opportunities, opportunities, opportunities. That's why we you know, bring Barry McGuire in to talk about creative strategies. You know, we need to, as investors, we need to kind of embrace that and take advantage of this market right now. If you look here, we're putting up this chart called sellers are still hibernating and check out that blue bar 2023, uh, just over 50,000 uh, listings. And by the way, this is uh, this is not seasonally adjusted. These are the February new listings. Uh, still uh, way down, Patrick, way down from 2022 at 70,000. 2021 uh, was uh, just about 70,000. Uh, so there's still lots of room to go in terms of supply, not to be uh, a concern at all. And, and if you look at Toronto, uh, it's no different. I mean, the Toron just Toronto in itself separately, again, way down. In 2023. Well, I think, it, and we what we what we can't step over the fact that what this continues to do, and this is just one component of it all. What it continues to do is drive rental demand. So, having said all of that, as rental housing providers, we need to be that space for people to move into and uh, you know invest in real estate and get those rental properties out there. Well, we actually moved in. Oh, geez. I just noticed I still got three sticky notes on my desk, Patrick. We've already covered two topics, so I got to start throwing sticky notes at the camera. If you like what you learned here, go to the description below and subscribe for our free insiders newsletter where you can also stay up to date for our upcoming events and our courses. If you want to see more stuff like this, click here. If you want to see the entire show, click there.